Our next program point, our next speaker is Hannes Schmid. You hear him before already in the beginning of this, uh, of this day. He's the founder of Smiling Gecko, the project in Cambodia. And it's really a project that came from passion and that was passion and moved into sustainability. And I'm not going to introduce to you Hannes Schmid now with a lot of words. He's going to introduce himself with a film about his life. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Barbara. Well, I'd like to introduce myself very quickly so people who don't know me have an idea who I am and where I come from. Each photo tells a unique story. And each story becomes a stunning photo. Eine Geschichte zu erleben war mir nicht gut genug. Ich musste sie leben. Realität zu inszenieren, das war mein Ziel. Hannes Schmidt takes us to the most exciting locations in the world. Where other photographers reach their limits, he goes a step further to create images that have left their mark on the memory of entire generations. Treat your eyes to an amazing journey. As you see, I'm an artist, uh, <laughs> not coming out of philanthropy or finance or economy. A little bit more than five years ago, I was working on a project in Thailand, and on the way uh, to the restaurant in the evening uh, on the bridge, there was a little girl in a corner, and she was begging. She had a little kind of a metal box in front of her, but she was covered with a piece of fabric. So I noodled in my pocket, I took out some butt, and I threw it into this little box, and this girl just shook together and this fabric went off her face and then I shook together. It was a brutally burned face, wide eye looking at me and I saw her whole body is burned and I was very shocked. I, I just couldn't take it. I wasn't expecting it. So I was running off. I wanted to meet a friend for dinner. I said to my friend, look, I cannot eat. I have to go back. I have to know what's happened to this child. So when I came back, she was gone. Next day, I said, I have to go find her. So I was trying, looking around in the morning. She was not there. In the afternoon, I found her again on the same corner. So I tried to talk to her, speak a little bit of Thai. And I thought, wow, she doesn't speak Thai. And the guy passed by and said to me, sir, uh, don't speak Thai to her. She's a Cambodian. You have to speak Khmer. And by the way, she's a begging doll. They have made her purposely like this so she makes more money. So I couldn't believe. I was like, shiver. I said, can't be. Well, I took an interpreter the next day, and she was telling me the story. Her name is Wei. She's from Battambang, uh, father rice farmer, nine children, very, very poor, and, uh, well, like a lot of them, in depth. So, you know, there was the uh, Vietnamese loan sharks who pressured them, and they have to pay back, but so the only possibility had to sell his two daughters, but nobody wanted them. So he took a blowtorch, and he burned their face and their body. And Wei was then given or sold to an old woman. The old woman brought her to Thailand and sold her on to a backing syndication. That's Wei today. Because I brought her back to Phnom Penh, put her in an orphanage, and uh, this amazing woman has... Uh, well, she's one of my favorite in my life, because uh, when we put there, uh, she was 13 already, 10 years living on the bridge, being sexually abused, being put in jail, taken out of jail, being beaten up, and she had to give every evening the money to the begging syndication. She never saw a doctor, she never was in school. So we put her into school, and she started to work hard, and, well, she just turned 19 now, and with 18, she finished her high school, and she is now at the University in Phnom Penh, and she wants to change her money, her life, and the country. 
Well, then I found out that when I spoke to the lady at the orphanage, there is many of these children in Cambodia. Well, sometimes 200 a year, they plunge with assets and they sell them off. There's a lot of trafficking going on. It's daily standard that you sell your children, very cheap. But I asked him, where are they from? Where they come from? She said, well, you have to go to the dump site outside of Phnom Penh. It's a huge dump site. So next day I went out there and I started to discover what is life out there. So I was renting for myself. I had for 50 cents a day and started living there. I became a member of the dump community. And I tell you, this is life you cannot even imagine. You know, these are children, how they live there. There is no food. There is no clean water. Right? And toilets, no, you can do it in your house, it doesn't matter because if the rain comes, everything is flooding around, there is rats at night, you know, there is everything you can imagine. And during the day, the children have to work with their families. Usually families have like four children, six children. They start when the sun goes up, you know, they have like no shoes, so they make their way through, you know, metal to broken glass, and uh, they try, they have a metal hook, so they try to pull out pet bottles, uh, Coca-Cola cans, uh, plastic, wires, and then this gets all collected. So it's a kind of a special way of recycling they do, right? And if a whole family is working the whole day, they make maybe a dollar fifty, sometimes a dollar twenty, but one kilo of rice is ninety cents. So a lot of them they have nothing to eat. So they're depending on tearing the plastic bags who are coming from the city, who are already two days laying, three days laying around, stinky, smelly, and then they have to dig for food in the plastic bags. And that's all what they have to eat. But then they need big plastic bags. So there is a kind of a business. These people, hard-working people. They're not sitting around, they're not lazy. Well, around the slum, you know, there is this kind of little businesses. So there is family, 60, 70 families, and they take cement bags. Bags were, had chemicals in it, and they saw the big bags, where then the pet bottle gets put in. But this is very, very, very dangerous. This family living in this poison, after eight, nine months, the children start to draw up blood. The mother starts to draw up blood. And I tell you, we have daily children and families dying in what they do. To earn a dollar a day, where you cannot even feed your family, this is reality. But in the meantime, because I'm living there, the reason why I live there is because every month our things are changing. <laughs> one month, this works to make money. The next month, something else works to make money. But you know, recycling, suddenly the hotels, they don't give this away to the rubbish anymore, they recycle themselves, right? Cardboard, they don't give it away anymore, they recycle themselves because the Vietnamese and the Thai, you know, they come by, buy the hotels and they buy their stuff. So what is left for these families in the slums? And what is left for the families on the waste hill? It's their children. Well, if you look at this beautiful girl, yeah, she's that time about seven years old, and if you look at her mouth, this is your sexual disease. We have in Phnom Penh over 6,000 girls in the age from 5 to 12 in the child prostitution. 25 cents they pay for a blowjob. Five blowjob, a kilo rice. Three blowjob, no rice. The children get beaten up. But it goes on. It not even stops there. No. She is 11. She has just been sold for $1,000 for her virginity. But this is not the end of it. They stitch her up again. The second guy pays 500. The next time when she's stitched up again, 250. And then he goes down, and at the end it's $2.50 for the sexual intercourse with the child. She is five years old. The mother is painting her lips every day red, so she sticks out of the other girls in the Black River slum. She's very ill. She's infected by a heartworm disease. It's horrible, absolutely horrifying. It is supported by the government, by the police. They make the money with it. Well, the girls who are turning 15, 16, of course, there's no condoms. They're getting pregnant. Well, what happened to the child? The mother is affected by the sexual disease. We have malaria, we have typhoid, we have encephalitis, and then dengue fever. Very often we have this, this epidemic. These children all die because they cannot survive, right? And when we have the rainy season, it gets even worse because they don't have money to buy gas to cook 
They use wood. The wood is wet. Typhoid is harassing us. We have the children dying because we have no clean water. But we fight. These people fight to survive. It's horrible to see this picture, but we're killing the dogs if we find them. We're killing rats. We're killing everything. So that there is something sustainable in the soup we have to cook every day. And the boys, you know, they're very innovative, right? Phnom Penh has actually no infrastructure. Sorry, my language, but the shit and the pee runs into these channels. These channels open, it runs out to these lakes, and that's where mainly the vegetables are grown, where you eat in Phnom Penh, there. But 20 past six becomes a very special magical hour because the bats started to fly. The bats fly 50, 60 centimeter above this dirty, stinky water because it's millions of mosquitoes there. The boys get into the water with a stick. They try to hit them down so that they have something to eat that evening. But this water is deadly. It's surge. They dive under. They try to catch the bats. They swallow the water. And every week we lose children because they're out of conscious, they disappear, and then five, six days later on, they're drifting up out of that black water somewhere. Sometimes they get washed out to the lakes. Well, when I discovered all this, it was very difficult for me, and especially with all this, you know, acid. We not call them victims, we call them survivor, because not many of them really survive. So I made friend with Dr. Jim, it's Children's Surgical Center, Right? He has about 800 children every day in front of his hospital. It's a kind of a special surgical center to you know, do skin transplantation. And this picture you see now, they're not nice. But we cannot afford to turn our face anymore on something like this. This is a seven-year-old girl, blanched with acid. The babies, they bring the most money because you can use them the longest. Right? And this is a young girl, well, she just got the whole splash in her face, right? And this is when we tried to fix them up. But in Cambodia, we're so far behind, we are in the 1960s of our medical standard. Actually, in the cities, yes, we have a little bit of standard. But on the countryside, there is no medical standard existing. So I said, Hannes, I, I, I cannot bear this. I have to do something. So when I start moving out there to the slums, I start to meet the families and you know, I start to talk with them. So I start life support donation. That's what a lot of the NGO do. I go out there, you know, I display rice, you know. By the end, it was about nine tons of rice per month. It was about 7,500 7, liters of mineral water and it was about... 900 to 1,000 cans of milk powder because these babies, they had no chance to survive out there. After seven months, this, playing all this stuff, becoming a member of this family, I said, Hannes, I have not achieved anything. You know, uh, giving them a bit of rice and a bit of milk power. They still live in this poverty. They still every day fight to succeed, not for the next day. No, in the morning, for the morning, at lunch, for lunch, and for dinner, at dinner. The children still getting sick out there. So I do something wrong. I haven't not moved anything, right? So I said, I have to take over the children. I was in the meantime with 380, nearly 390 families. I was a part of them. So I selected 280 kids, you know. Then I was buying 280 pair of sneakers, school uniforms, rucksacks, books, pens, right? And uh, well, I had to buy tuk-tuks so I could drive them to the school, but at the school I had to pay 25 cents, 50 cents, 75 cents per student. And at home I had to pay 25, 70 cents to a dollar because the children couldn't help to recycle anymore. So there was no income from the children, right? And I was so happy, you cannot believe. I said, Hannes, this is the right way to do, this is fantastic, I have to support children. After seven months I was sitting down and said, Hannes, this is even more stupid than what I did before. Because why? While well, I'm nearly 70 years old, how many years can I support these children? Like here in Europe, 20 years, 25 years we support our children. Did they out of education? Now I come and pay, you know, primary school is actually not even much better than the kindergarten here, right? Uh, if you're lucky, right? And then what is after? 
So I said, what do I have to do? How is the system here in Europe? Well, our parents, they have jobs, right? They earn money. And because they earn money, they have a job, right? Their children can have an education. They can survive. I said, this is exactly what I do. I need an economical sense behind what I do. Well, I talked to the families and said, hey, where are you from? They said, well, this province, this province. I said, do you have still land? No, lost the land. It's taken away. Either the government has taken or we have lost it. I said, but do you have any relatives? Yeah, uncle, aunties. Okay. I packed the trucks, put 10, 15 families on top of it. I was driving 60, 80 kilometers up to the north, and I started to do fish farms, chicken farms, pigs. And I said, Great, now they can earn money, right? They can sell their fish, right? They can sell their pigs. But oh my God, I tell you, it was a wake-up call. The chicken, 1,000, well, 700 died in three weeks, right? Well, I had no antibiotics. They are chemical, the CPO chicken, right? The pigs couldn't walk really anymore after a month. So we had to give antibiotics because they were all sick because genetics was nowhere, right? And the chicken... Well, you know, they died like this. The fish, they turned upside down after three weeks. They had all like big white spots, you know, funguses. They all died. I said, oh my God, what do we do here? It was not really successful. It was one very big failure I produced, right? And then when I was sending money, in the meantime, I had a bank account, right? to the can, can, uh, Canadian bank. I sent 15,000 Swiss francs. It was all my money, my, of our pocket. I never got the 15,000, you know, I went to the bank and I showed here is my account, Swift, and they said, oh, sorry, sir, uh, we have only 10. I said, no, 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 I did send 15. I said, no, no, sorry, sorry, 10. Do you want the 10 or do you don't want the 10? <laughs> well, we're living in one of the corruptest countries in the world. From the index of 168, we just climbed up to 165. Nearly everything is owned by Hun Sin, the president, 276 company he owns with his family. So he knows how to make cash, right? Well, I went back to Jim and I complained. I said, Jim, look, these kind of, sorry, suckers, take my money and things like this. He said, Hannes, you have to be clever. You have to become local. If you're a local NGO, they don't take anything because locals, they don't have money. The internationals and the private they have, but become a local. How do I do this? Take a lawyer. So by a chance, I always stayed in a very cheap hotel when I was in the city. I got introduced to Lip. Lip is in the room. So he's a young lawyer, he was on his way to Australia, there is Lip. And I said to Lip, Lip, you cannot go, you have to do something for your country, you have to help me to find Smiley Gecko Cambodia. He said, oh, maybe not so easy, you know, take you know, eight months. I said, I don't have time, whatever it needs. Four months, we had registered Smiley Gecko Cambodia. This was in May 2014. When we read together the papers we got from the government, we realized we can own land. It's a local month, no problem, right? Okay. Then I had a tuk-tuk driver, Soapy, you know, he was my bodyguard, right? And uh, he said, oh, where I live, very beautiful land. You have to go out there. So we went out there. We went there in rainy season. Everything was green, beautiful water. I said, okay, can we buy land? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has a farmer there. And so we bought the first uh, nine hectares of land, right? And we started the agriculture family project. I said, what a nonsense to support people in the slums or on the waste hill, we have to take them out of there. We have to bring them back to the countryside. And we're building a farm. And for this, I did a drawing. I calculated uh, 12 families, about 280 people, right? Everybody had fish, everybody had chicken, everybody had pigs, right? But we had a problem. We are on the flooding area of the Don uh, uh, So that means in the rainy season, we're getting flooded. So I had to build a big pond at back. I had to dig out three. 23,000 cubic of earth to fill up all the area where we're building our farm so that the fish then at the end don't swim to the chicken. <laughs> well, the rain came and we were flooded. So we had to rethink our construction. So we were actually producing ourselves 760 meter of concrete pipes, right? And then we dig them into the ground. You know, that's how it looked then. But there was a big mistake because uh, I was asking them to take a, a geometer because I had to go back to Switzerland. I'm there every month. And the geometer had no time. So they were using this kind of, you know, tube with the bubble. But fortunately, I came, and this dig hole was still open, and I looked, and I said, guys, they go uphill. <laughs> they said, no, 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 no. I said, how do you measure it? I said, oh, my God. Well, we had to dig them out again, you know, <laughs> starting from the scratch. But my goal was 
We need to go on speed. We need to get these people out there. November 2014, the first families moved into our farm. They moved in into beautiful wooden houses. We started with our agriculture. We had everybody out there. All the people we took in had to help us to build their homes so that they got an understanding what it means, right? And of course, we started again with fish, we started again with chicken, and we started again with pigs. Well, we were a little bit better, but really not that good, you know. So I used natural material, I didn't have money. So I used like the things they do, we had a cement floor, and you see the, chicken, the, the pig still humples a little bit here, you know. But it was important, we're making progress, we go forward, and I said, let's build this whole thing, and then after we try to find a way to make it better, we're learning. I know experience, these guys know experience, important war, a house out of wood. It's NGOs building metal sheds. How can you live in a metal shed when that is 46 degrees centigrade outside? You can really grow your eggs or build your eggs on the floor, right? And that's how we went on. Well, it was a difficult time. So my pigs didn't do well, my chickens didn't well either, uh, my fish were still dying. So I came back to Switzerland, I wrote an email at uh, 12 uh, uh, agriculture schools here and I said, help, I'm this artist, try to become an agriculture guy. And well, one um, wrote back to me and said, hey, Mr. Schmidt, uh, sounds interesting, a project, come for a coffee. So I went to Ham for a coffee to Martin Pfister and he looked at me and I told him the story and said, well, we cannot solve your problem over a coffee, right? But you know what, I think I send you two of our agriculture engineers so they can really look into it because I see there is some other problems. Well, they came down, we started to realize actually we have no soil, 6%. You need 40, 35 to 40% that you can grow something, right? The chickens, they said mostly, you know, how many eggs do they lay? I said, I don't know, maybe two, three a week. I said, well, you need seven a week, right? So they completely degenerated, right? The pigs, he said, well, if I look at your video, they wobble, you know, it's no good either. And uh, we started from the scratch. So we started actually with an agriculture school. Today we have a big nursery. We have pulled more than 140,000 plants out of seeds, trees, bushes. You know, there was nothing before. We have uh, every two months, three months, we have our agriculture engineers. We're trying to improve uh, through fertilizer, uh, to uh, compost uh, our, our soils. And in the meantime, in this, yeah, uh, three years, we have already uh, produced uh, quite a big number of agriculture engineers. They studied uh, in Phnom Penh. But the problem is they study in Khmer. And when they finish their study, they've never practiced on a farm. It's the same with the architect. They close up, you know, their uh, uh, kind of uh, diploma. They've never been on the construction site. And then if you want to learn more, there's nothing existing in Khmer. There is no way you can go anywhere further and we had a hard time. First, we had to really teach them a better English till they understood what we want to do. But for me, it was very clear. I cannot take care about my 300 people I have. I have to take care about the area. Otherwise, we become the rich and around they become the poor. So I thought, we have to start an agriculture school where we take all the farmers in and teach them. So that's how we started off, right? We have about 150, 180 people who are coming to our agriculture school. We learn them how to fertilize. We learn them how to treat the chicken. Uh, hygienics, you know, it's very important. The feed, if you feed too much, you lose money. If you feed not enough, right? Well, they don't grow. Right? And if you feed the wrong stuff, they die. So, you know, it's very difficult, but we're making huge progress. And then I realized that if I want to have a market to sell our products, it's not enough. I have 12 farmers. You know, I have to extend. Because if I want to sell Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday into the city to a dealer, the dealer say, yeah, do you have or you don't have? Then I say, no, I don't have. They said, well, then I have to look for another supplier. So I realized immediately we have to become bigger today. We have 150 hectares of land. We have 60 hectares of very competent bio-organic vegetable growth, right? We're very innovative. You know, we have about 280 workers, local workers around. They make money with us. They are in, uh, involved in our system, right? We have uh, um, eggplants, beans, cucumbers, right? And when you look at these cucumbers, they are bio-organic. And we have a problem. 
uh, difficult to sell. Because, you know, I competing with the Vietnamese and the Thai, these are chemical products, they look beautiful. You know, the carrots, they glow. They all look the same. The cucumber, they look all the same. My own look like... And the local people say, oh, it can't be good. It looks really shabby, right? <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 all these kind of things, you come as a Western and say, buy organic, great. They don't want it, right? Then my green uh, Thai tomatoes, right? But today we are able to put out of like two, three hectares, uh, 10,000 kilos, 15,000 kilos of our products. And then my chickens, you know, my chickens, I tell you. That was a big challenge. Because we realized, well, how can you breed chicken when they only eat two eggs a week, right? So we had to find out, how do we do this? Well, we had a wooden box. We took 10 hens, one rooster, sometimes two roosters. We thought maybe huh, there's a bit of competition, right? <laughs> okay. Then the chicken had a number, so it went into the box, laid an egg. The egg had a number, right? And then we see, after a week, does the hen lay two eggs, five eggs? If it was three eggs, goes into the soup. Five eggs, we gave him a more chance, right? But then we took the most aggressive chicken, little baby chicken, and the ones who were growing the fastest and eat the most, we took them, you know, for the next mother chicken. So today, you know, we're producing 90,000 chickens and we're going up to 25,000 hens at the moment, right? And we uh, breed our own eggs, uh, we vaccinate our chickens, we have a very high standard, and it's a very special chicken, it's a semi-wild chicken, so it's less vulnerable to infection diseases. My pigs, I tell you, I love my pigs. And if you see them, look how they look like. They are most beautiful. They don't smell, they're lovely. And I tell you, we produce the best meat you can ever eat. Our uh, pork looks like veal, pure white fat, an amazing taste, and this is our future. Now we are extending. In 2019, we want to produce 2,400 piglets a year, and you would not believe this gives us a net profit of $240,000 a year. This is if we sell them off. But now we're building a slaughterhouse, we're building a butchery, we go from nose to tail, we will 10 times make more money with that. When you are in agriculture, you have to make sure that you get the most out of it. But that also means another 50, 60, 80 more people we can employ, we can educate to become butchers, you know, uh, slaughters, you know, and they how know to really how to make a sausage. My fish, you know, I'm a fish lover. Everybody knows fish is important for our future, right? So we have an amazing institution in Zurich, it's the Swiss University of Applied Science in Veringville, the worldwide leader in fish researchers. So I went there, uh, another coffee with the guys, right? And I thought, hey, can we do something? Can we kind of, um, you know, breed fish, right? So we had a couple of talks, and they thought it was very interesting. So they were sending their people down, and we made an evaluation, and we said, well, we actually have a very good ground, because I'm building very big lakes. You know, we have four and a half to five months drought, so I need to collect the rainwater. So I'm building lakes, 90,000 cubic, 110,000 cubic. Now we're going on, we're building two more, 250,000 cubic. So we're collecting the rainwater. We're not pumping out the groundwater. This is too valuable for us for drinking water. Rainwater, but the rainwater is empty. Now the idea is when we start producing fish in there, the fish will enrich the water and we have a top quality agriculture water out of it, right? Well, it took a little bit ups and downs and ups and downs and the Swiss University of Applied Science now have their own science center they're building with us and I think in a very short time we will be leading in producing we're starting with the tilapia it's a very easy fish average fish but we want to do a special fish because we have somehow discovered it could have a little pink uh, color in it and I said this is great you know tilapia nobody wants tilapia why don't we call them purple rain you know prince yeah, yeah. we call them purple rain so we already have the marketing system <laughs> stand by. But I tell you, 4th of March, the first 35,000 healthy, genetically clean fish came from Thailand because that's where the university is working in. Now we're starting and you will see how fast and how amazing we're making progress and what we can achieve. Because the idea is we breed the fish, but we do not the fattening. We take the first 10 farmers, 20 farmers, 50 farmers, 100 farmers, we build them the ponds and they do the fattening for us. At the end, we get all the fish together again and we produce fish filet. Look at these figures, 
2020, one million kilo of fish. And this is to achieve. Maybe, okay, it takes another year, but who cares, right? We have a little bit of time. Then one of the biggest problems is rice. I don't know, uh, there is lately a lot of uh, stories about rice. 60% of the world's rice growing is in the Mekong Delta. Well, the Chinese have built 20 dams. There is no flooding anymore of the Mekong. That means also no flooding of the Ton Lesa. That means rice production goes down and down and down. Because the rice production goes down, the farmers cannot live from what they produce. Their children have to move into the cities. So actually, instead of slowing down urbanization, we're increasing urbanization. We have to change that. Very important. But the problem is, usually, Batambang is the area they produce rice, and there are the big rice mills and the rice companies. They don't want to drive two days to pick up the rice. So actually, the production is nearly nothing. Up there, five tons, seven tons by hectare. We are maybe happy if we have two tons per hectare. It's not enough to live. I said, we have to change that, you know. So I had an idea. So if we have rice, and the big rice mills are far away, why don't we build our own rice mill? Well, we bring the rice meal to the rice paddies. So I went to Bühler, you know, I had a meeting there, and I offered them a new business model. Well, they were looking at me like I'm a crazy man, you know, since 20 years or 25 years in the rice business. And I said to them, yeah, it's great. How many big rice meals you build a year? Maybe one, maybe two. I said, but we could build 500 a year. Small ones, right? Increases your business. Okay, so I realized we have 12,000 to 14,000 hectares of rice around our farm. These are 3,000 farmers, this is 20,000 people plus. If I have a rice meal and I produce a healthy rice, a clean rice, it will increase the income four, five times. And not only that, we're losing 30% from the paddy to the rice meal. If they're a farmer, they're cutting in the morning, it's wet, then it goes into the truck, the truck sits around, then they put them in the bags, bag sits around. 30% of the world's grow of rice is rotten before we have. We have to save that. There is less and less rice. Okay, now we're already on the project. We're starting. Uh, yesterday, uh, uh, the president of uh, Bühler was here too, and uh, we're starting our rice meal. And what does it mean, this rice meal? Because when we produce rice, the most uh, valuable thing is the leftover. It's the husk. The husk is amazingly with vitamins, mineral, it's full with oils, it's everything there. So beside the rice meal, we build a feed meal. We can use that to produce animal feed. And because by one million kilo of fish, when we do fillets, we have about 400,000 to maybe even 550,000 fish products as a leftover. We produce animal protein, fish flour. So then we add the fish flour to our rice meal stuff for the animal, and we will produce in the next two, three years, we probably become the largest and the most competent producer of animal feed, 100% bio-organic. We try to close the circle. I know there is many, many different bamboo projects, and it's amazing. I also it's incredible what Hilti does, you know, helping to really improve uh, housing. Uh, I met uh, Professor Dirk Cable from the ETH, he's a specialist in this alternative uh, construction and building material, and I learned that you can actually win the fiber out of the bamboo. The short fiber, you do fabrics, right, underwear, socks, uh, t-shirts, and the long fiber, you can do a very sustainable construction material. It's two common glue, component glue. Today, we are able to use no chemicals, so it's a 100% organic thing, and these rods can exchange the steel in concrete. But you can build railway bridges, everything out of this material because it's very sturdy, it has a similar kind of uh, uh, fact than steel. And what you see in the back is concrete in the near future. It's a biomass with a, a mushroom. You can produce a system who is like concrete. And uh, you know, I'm very, very happy that I'm with Hilti because this stuff is so tough, you need a Hilti drilling machine to make a hole in it. You know? so, so I'm very happy I get supported by that. Well, but then around my farm, about 700, 790 children going to school, right? Very bad school, horrible. That's how they looked when I came, you know. There's no food in that school. Five teachers for 780 kids. And the teachers, well, I think if they would here in Switzerland, they would maybe would be happy if they reached uh, 
class three, you know? I mean, uh, they really, there is no system or no really com comprehensive system. So I said, I have to change that. I have to, this is not possible. So I started to renovate the school. We built a new school table. We brought in books. We started to support the teachers, right? And children who have no food, they are not able uh, to learn, right? They are hungry. There is no proteins. There's no nothing these children have. And on the countryside, I tell you, they go in the morning, they hunt for frogs and for lizards. This is what the family eats. We are the poorest country in Southeast Asia and one of the poorest in the world. And this is also the question I had. Is now we have 4,000 NGOs since 20 years in Cambodia. Now you take two-thirds away, it's still 1,200 NGOs. And after 20 years, we're still the poorest country. We still have no medical system. We still have no school system. There is nothing on the countryside, and 80% of the population lives on the countryside. I said, there's something wrong here. What, what is wrong? Why, why doesn't it work, right? Well, the men's are fantastic in... One and a half years, we have an enormous increase of the health of the children. I drilled 180 meters deep to get clean drinking water. Mainly the NGOs, they drill 25 meters, 30 meters. Well, it's great when you have on your CV, well, we have just drilled 1,300 fountains. Everybody thinks great because we understand the fountain delivers water. These fountains only have water in the rainy season. Comes the dry season, it's not. And of course, 25 meters you can pump, but if you go 180 meters, you have to have a diesel, you have to have power to pump the water up. But then they cost $3,500 instead of $40. And it's all these systems I discovered. I didn't know, I'm not an NGO. I had like, no idea what's going on, but I had these question marks. I was questioning myself, right? And then I said, look at my school, 580 kids. 80% drop out after the second grade, 80%. And the 20%, where do they go after? There's no other school. They have primary school, but there's no secondary, or the secondary school is so far away that the parents don't have the money to send them there. I said, but there's something totally wrong with this system. I mean, what do we have? We have in a village, we have primary school, secondary school, and then they can go maybe to the next village when they go into for their gymnasium. I said, I need a different school. A school where everything all in one. So, again, I went to Professor Dirk Hebel and I said, uh, I need your help. Can the university help me? He said, yeah, you know, we have uh, 34 students. They just have to do their diploma work. And uh, yeah, why don't we send them down? And they study what you need. Well, they all came down. We studied on Corvat and, you know, the reflection of the sun and the water and the weather. And, you know, like really. <laughs> it was amazing. After eight months, we had 18 perfect schools, planned into the detail. So we looked at it, you know, there was the diploma work, and then we said, well, there's a lot of, you know, like, more too big or too small. We took a team of, and I'm very proud of it, five women young architects. You know, I mean, architects usually men, huh? right? All the famous ones. These five women started to work. In eight months, they planned this amazing school who has so much idea and so much competent kind of architecture, right? But, of course, we wanted to build with this new material, but we are not ready yet. First, we have to grow the bamboo, then we have to do the whole thing. So, we also have to use wood, uh, concrete, and bricks. So, I said, hey, wood, fantastic. You know, we have hundred thousands of young people, 8, 15, 16, 17, 18, they have no education, but they have a skill. They're good. They want to work. I said, why don't I build my own carpentry? So I can educate them. Carpenter? I'm a carpenter, I understand. Okay, so I started to do my planning again, right? And I have a friend, he's a carpenter, and I was sitting down with him, and he told me what kind of machines I need, right? And with this uh, piece of paper, I went to the largest uh, dealer of a uh, carpentry machine, and I said, you know, my friends, I mean, I need uh, this machine, and uh, this I need, and uh, this I need, and this. And uh, Peter Eigema was like writing, and writing, and he said, uh, Mr. Schmidt, do, do you know how much it costs? It can't be that expensive, you know? It's just like... 
machine, yeah, for wood. He said, well, this one is 80,000, this is 120,000. I said, oh my God. He said, well, this is anyway, this is the wrong machines. You know, like, you know, 15, 18 year old machines, you know, do you have a switch, you know, this digital electronic stuff in the tropics is not going to work. And even in Switzerland, the carpenters don't even know how to handle it. Okay, we made a deal. He was looking for machines and I started. I said, okay, you look for the machines. I started. May 2016, I started to dig my foundation, you know. And in August 2016, my carpentry was ready to go. In the meantime, I was very lucky. In St. Gallen, there was a carpentry shop burned down, right? And, uh, well, the machines were all there, and they were just a little bit black. The insurers uh, write it off, and uh, Peter could talk to them, so they paid 50000 Dollar or the Swiss francs on top to renovate the machine. And I only had to go to Mr. Kühne of Kühne Nagel and begging for a container. And that all happened, right? This is our carpentry shop now, you know, and it's as beautiful as any carpentry shop in uh, uh, Switzerland. But I had no carpenter. <laughs> how, how, how do you teach them to be a carpenter if you don't have a carpenter, right? But Switzerland is fantastic. I went to Biel, you know, this is the Holzfachschule. They have wood engineers after their study, four years, becoming engineers, they have to do one year practice. So I talked to the school and said, yeah, this is a good idea. Why, why don't we send them down to you? Now we have six of them. We have specialists for construction, for furniture, for everything. And we were uh, in one year developing a curriculum because you have to understand this children or these young boys, they can't read and write. So we went on the principle of a two-year short uh, uh, apprenticeship in Switzerland. We realized five to six years. We have to read, we have to tell them how to read. We have to give them the understanding of geometrics, what is an angle, how do you, how do, you do this, how, what kind of instrument you use, you know? And then I discovered something really incredible, right? We will have about maybe 15, 20 fantastic carpenters in five to six years but you would not believe. I don't know where they go because there's no other carpenter shop in Cambodia. Well, that's how we plan, you know? We always think we do very good. We plan something and we don't understand <laughs> that there is no system. If I take a carpentry shop here in Shan, well, there is another one in, uh, uh, next door or in Altstedt or in St. Gallen because our systems are complete. In these countries, there is no system. And this is what we actually really missed in the last 20 years to build these systems. But in the meantime, my carpentry shop has grown, right? We're producing for our school all the woodwork. It's huge. It has grown to a manufacturing system, over 55 people working in there. We're highly competent in furniture, in building houses. We have several teams. We have external uh, builders, you know, where we prepare the material. They build our bungalows, they build our houses. And this is what we achieved in one and a half year, you know, we have a fantastic team, we have a fantastic education system, and these people will be the people who will have a future. But it's not enough. I said, I need more. I need to train electricians, plumbers, bricklayers, you know, all this kind. It's all about construction. Cambodia is growing. Construction, construction, construction. So now we are starting to build these industrial education and training campuses. My goal is in one year, we have the first 100 uh, young people who move in there and they go to a four, five year uh, apprenticeship like we have in Switzerland. Well, they go two days to school and three days they have practice. It's better they get into practice. We shift from three days school to two days. But this is the system what we have here. Well, in the meantime, you know, I got under pressure because I know my clock is ticking. I had all these plans from the ETH about my school. Everything was ready, right? And I knew they have a rainy season coming. Then I knew 15 of November I have to open my school. Otherwise, I lose a whole season. In July 2017, we started to dig. Hundred thousand of cubic of earth we had to move. You know, later on I got together with Implenia, you know, this big discussion, and Tony Affetranger said, Well, this will be the third largest construction site in Switzerland. I said, Oh, I'm very happy, you know. <laughs> July till November 2017, we started to build. My dream became true. I was able to drive a truck and the caterpillar, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's every boy's dream, you know, to dig in the mud. It's fantastic, right? But we had a goal. 
the carpentry shop had to produce more frames, more frames. We were on one frame first, but I needed three frames a day, otherwise we couldn't really match the date. We had to build it up, these frames, right? We had horrible rainy season. We lost nearly two months because we washed out time, we had lightnings, you know. I had to employ more people, more people, but we did not give up. 280, nearly 300 people were building on this school because I had a deadline. I could not miss the deadline, right? And it was amazing to see how skilled these people are with the help of Implenia, with the engineering, with our architects, local architects, with really all we could put in. And you have to understand, all this is managed by Cambodian. I said Cambodians have to run the show, not the Swiss. They have to learn to run the show. And Leap does an amazing job. I always said, Leap, if you would be born in Switzerland, you would exchange Sergio Emotti tomorrow. You would be the better guy who runs the bank, you know, if I see what he does. It came 15th of November. We had two second-hand buses. And I tell you, I was crying, my heart open. We had these children picking up, area 12 kilometers around the school. They were never in a school like this. They were never in a bus like this. Look at the boys, how they sit there, how proud they are, right? The girls, look how they come. Everything was still not finished, you know. We're still building everywhere, but, you know, we had the flag. It's very important, right? And uh, what is very important to understand is uh, when I started this with the ETH, I realized we don't have a school system. How do I do? So I contacted the Pedagogic High School in Zurich. I met uh, Iris and uh, Rolf Kolob, and I said, can you help us? You know, I mean, this is horrible what we have. So they looked at it. They helped us even to change the architecture of the school because actually ETH was building not an individual school. We needed to have different rooms, different things. And today ETH is uh, helping us, supporting us to build a new education system. Well, I built sports first. Sport first. These children never had sports in their life. It's a completely different system we have. We have a girl team. They beat the guys. Hey, what do you want more? Uh, we invest in the girls here. This, all what you see, is done from July till November. But we're not finished. I said before, I need a school. I need a complete school. We're starting in November with three-year-old, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, primary, secondary, high school, and we building already the university complex. Because I have big institutions now, they batching up with us. So we are able to really push on in science. And then I had so many people, they came to me, and they wanted to stay, but there was no room to stay. Yeah, these shabby huts, and oh, they were okay for the locals, but then I said, hey, it could be another business model. Why don't I build a little hotel, right? Well, everybody pays. So first I had this, you know, simple houses, charge 50 bucks, I'd never make money with 50 bucks, I need much better. I need like air conditioning bungalows, I need a fantastic kitchen, I need a restaurant, I need a reception, right? And this was going, building, 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 and then, okay, I have no idea about how to run a restaurant. So I went to the Hotel Fachschule in Luzern, and they were helping us. Two years, they were sending their coaches, they were sending their students, and I tell you, I believe today we have the best trained hotel people in whole Cambodia. They have a top education in anything, in servicing. By the way, we will have lunch after. Maria is here, our chef cook, and uh, the people are here, so you will enjoy her food. I tell you, if you ever want to spend the most beautiful holidays in your life, <laughs> this is the place to go. Everything is built from our own teams. The interiors, I built a beautiful swimming pool. Right? We broke the rocks in the north of Cambodia. And why did I do this? I have rainy season, no tourists. Now I can sell yoga retreats but when they come there they go to the ocean I say no you can swim we have a pool we have two beautiful yoga shalas we have massage center we have amazing uh, organic food Maria our chef will really show you how beautiful Cambodian food is right uh, I want the best cappuccino latte macchiato right uh, Seha is here now being trained by the world champion and as well, we have beautiful temples where we work together with the monks. You can do and come, you can meditate. Uh, you will feel Cambodia where nobody else in the world, you can feel Cambodia. Very beautiful. No tourists, nobody comes there. It's just us. And I did build my own railway. 
I found 140 kilometers from the French, so I built my dress in. We have 28 today, and we're transporting children to school, factory workers to the factories, and cows, and motorbikes. And uh, we will, in this year, with about 28 to 30 percent occupancy, reach a net profit of nearly $400,000. I need $570,000 to buy food for 1,100 children, three meals a day. And that's what our system is. We generate money and we put the generate money back into the next. So my belief is in four years, I don't need to go and back for money anymore. We are completely self-sustained with whatever we do. At the moment, we need more investment money because we have to reach that level that we are competent in the market. But this we will reach. So this is our teams now in the hotel, very well-trained people from kitchen, from gardener, for housekeeping, laundry, uh, everything is very well-trained with us and we have Annegret Schlumpf with us. She is a 65-year-old uh, world chef, she is a butcher, a baker, a pastry chef and she's running for the next four years our school. Well, we have grown from nine hectares to 150 hectares and we grow more. And my conclusion was, after all this, after only three years working as a kind of hobby uh, NGO, I realized this is the system generally of NGOs. So they have meant it very well. So everybody does a little bit. One a little bit water, and one a little bit mangoes, and the other one a little bit this. But nothing is holistic. And I said, we have to change that. If I see how is Switzerland working? It's all holistic. We have a village, and in this village, it's everything. So I said, okay, we're in the time of the digital evolution. Why don't I build a cloud around me? So in the cloud, I can work. So there is not a one-way street. So you can see 2014. Then you can see 2016. All what I told you slowly matches in. At the moment, we have about six and a half, seven thousand 7,000 people living from us. If we come in with the rice meal, we have uh, by, uh, you can say, mid of 2019, about 25 to 30,000 people living with us. And what was very important for me, I do not want to only improve, improve the life of the people we directly touch. I want to create an economical growth. The people around us have to have the benefit. In 2018, now we already have achieved that. And I can tell you, just for a simple measurement, we have about 280 workers. Well, seven months ago, they came by foot or they came on an ox uh, to us. Today, we have about 180 to 190 motorbikes parked. So they already have money to buy a motorbike. What does it mean, a motorbike on the countryside? You can go to the market, sell your chicken, sell your eggs, sell your vegetables, right? And they are improving their houses. They build bricks. They're extending their chicken houses. They're checking their, their pig houses. And this has to go on like this. This is 2019. There's medical coming in. This is 2020. And in 2025, this cluster, this city, we're projecting uh, 80, 70, 80, 19,000 people we live there, and I'm building the first smart village. You know, today there's a big thing about smart cities, but what does it help to build the smart cities when they cannot swallow the people who move from the country, uneducated, with no skills, into the cities? They're going to drown. Mexico City, 22 million. It is so much easier to build a smart village. There is nothing there. I build a road like this, I build a road like this, then I start to put my school and my agriculture and everything I built there, and we will be very effective. So I believe 2025. But my project is not finished. Why? You know, the Chinese, they played from 2050. That's how the Chinese, well, our governments, they're happy if they plan for 2025 or, well, 2030 is already far away. We start to duplicate in 2030 seven times. We start to duplicate the cluster in 2035. And by 2050, we have calculated, it is a model, but there is realism in it, that we could produce 30% of the GDP of Cambodia with this system, just by exchanging imports, or 80% into domestic production. And the domestic production then can actually export food. Food is what everybody needs. I know I'm late, but I'm always late when I'm talking. But I want to have Wei telling her story. She's one of the most amazing women I've ever met. And uh, what she went through in her life, you don't want to do that. And a couple of months ago, I took her the first time home to her father. And it was 
very, very sad. She took the father in her arm and uh, they all were crying. And, and you know how Cambodians deal with the history of the Red Khmer. Everybody denies everything nobody wants to talk about, right? And she said to her father, I, sh I, I know that wasn't really, it was, I'm sure it was an accident. You, you didn't want it that. And then you meant it well. You wanted to give me away to an old woman so that, you know, I maybe get an education and things like this. And that's how she are, goes around when she tells her story. And I took a little movie and I brought it to the UN and she was talking to the people. And I just want to show you this little clip, uh, the history of Way. When I was a small child, an accident happened, and my face and my body was badly burned. I can't remember exactly, but I know it was very painful for me. I remember after a while, my parents gave me away to an old woman who wanted me to sell a flower. The old woman brought me to Thailand and sold me to a begging syndication when I was three years old. From then on, I was begging on the street, the market, and on the bridge. My day was very long. I had to start early in the morning till it was late at night. When I was four years old, I was back in Pattaya. I was lucky when foreigners saw me and made more money. All the end of the day, I had to give my money to the baking syndication. The burn in my face, it was very bad. I was blind on one eye. To the burn of my mouth, my lip were sealed and I had difficult to eat. In all the four years, I was back here in Thailand. I had no medical help or education support. In 2004, the police was arresting me and put me in jail as I had no legal paper and I'm not from Thailand. I was Cambodian and I had no passport. Nowadays, I am very happy with my life. I can go to study like everyone. I can study English, computer, dancing. Also, you know, myself, I can sing very well. I like singing and dancing. I have many of friends. They really like me. Also, I love them too. We, we are so close. What I'm thinking is I have a good life, good friend, like everyone. I want to study politics and environment. That's why I, have, I want to change our countries. Because way I'm there, because all these people are there. And my conclusion after three years becoming an NGO or a social entrepreneur, I realized things can only move forward if these people can make profit, if philanthropy is preaching with economy. And that was the reason why I called in for this uh, kind of dialogue. I said, guys, please wake up. You know, please start working together. It was very nice when Egbert Apple said at the beginning, there has to be a change in our mind. We need to work together. Not everybody has to build a school. Not everybody has to grow pigs. Not everybody has to do things. We have to bench up. We have to bundle our resources. And then I'm sure we are able to change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.